We are continuing our study of the covenants. Are we learning anything here? Uh, I'm feeling really good, not just learning in terms of an intellectual growth, but I'm feeling really good about the uh, personal familial applications of this as well in terms of trust and relationship and not self-preservation and self-centeredness, uh, but other-centeredness. And really, that's the way the universe works, beloved. That is the way the universe works because as we put that first piece on the table there, what is it? That God is love. That's the way the universe works. And so I want my family to work that way. I want my life to work that way. I want my heart to work that way. I want to enter into covenant with God and to live the way that He created me to live. And that's what we're going to talk about now. We're really getting full on now into the guts of the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, so we're just going to pray again, and we're going to dive right in. We're going to pick up where we've left off. <sighs> Father in heaven, Jesus himself said that no man knows the day or the hour. No, not even the Son of Man, but, but my Father which is in heaven. And Father, we stand here. And it must be painful to your heart because you have communicated to us that there is a, a dynamic, that, that there is an elasticity in the day that Jesus will return. We can hasten or, by extension, slow that day. And Father, the prayer of my personal heart, David Ashrick's heart, and I'm sure that the others here pray this same prayer, as I don't want to be those, I don't want to be that kind of a person or among those who are slowing the process down. Father, make us movers and shakers in the literal sense, moving and shaking and agitating with regards to the kingdom of heaven on earth. Father, may we be dissatisfied with the status quo, with this world full of, of death and disease and oppression and injustice, murder and every other kind of violence and hate. Father, may this world not be our home. May we not feel comfortable here, even though the birds sing and the sun yet shines. May we have a deep dissatisfaction with this earth. May we pray in our innermost heart of hearts and our soul of souls, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, we know that that will never eventuate this side of the return of Christ. But may we be, in as much as we are able, creating that environment, creating that atmosphere. And Father, we long to live in harmony with the great principle upon which the universe operates, and that is love, other-centeredness. Father, remove even the last residual vestiges of self-preservation and self-centeredness and selfishness from us. All of those things which are out of harmony are, are in discord with, with the way that you have made the universe to operate. Father, teach us how to love as you loved, to live as you lived, to walk as Christ walked. And as we now continue our study of, of the covenants, Father, I pray that this would be far more than a mere intellectual or cerebral exercise for us. Father, May we enter into covenant with you. Teach us what that means. Teach us how to trust in the faithfulness of your Son, the Messiah Jesus. Be with us now as we open Scripture. Illumine our minds is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. In order to continue our presentation here, I want to start by reminding us of something that we've mentioned before, and that is the basic structure of the book of Genesis. We talked about there are 50 chapters in Genesis, and the first 11 of those chapters are by far the most hotly debated and hotly contested passages in all of Scripture. More than Jesus being born of a virgin, feeding the 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes, and even His resurrection from the dead. Uh, Genesis 1 to 11 is a, a cauldron of controversy, not just outside of the Christian church, but even inside of the Christian church. Um, because if Genesis 1 to 11 is portraying an actual history, and by the way, there are great textual and exegetical reasons to believe that this is more than figurative, it's more than metaphorical, metaphorical it is the history of the earth, right? Now, we're not going to spend any time on that here. That's another series to talk about the sort of evidences within Genesis to, to believe in its basic historicity. But our point here is this. You have 50 chapters, and the first 11 chapters cover roughly, you know, 2,000-ish years of human history, and then the last 39 chapters basically cover 100 to 150-ish years as, uh, as well. So when you think about that, it is very strongly, hugely, disproportionately weighted toward 
the history after Abraham and the history of Abraham, which kind of raises the question why. In this sense, it's a little bit like the Gospel of John, for example. You know, Jesus lives some 30-ish years on planet Earth, and John's Gospel is 21 chapters, right? 21 chapters. And the last few days of Jesus' life in the Gospel of John begin in John chapter 12. Now, just let that disproportion settle in for a moment. Here Jesus lives some roughly 30 years, which is basically John 1 to John 11, right? And then the last few days of His life is John 12 to John 21, right? In other words, the last few days and even hours of the life of Jesus. It's disproportionately weighted. In, in the book of Genesis, the reason that you have that disproportion is that it's as if Moses is racing to get to the point, right? to get to the main point, which is God's covenant with a man named Abraham. He just, there was creation, there was the flood, there was the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 12, we're at Abraham. Now, before we get right into the, the texts that talk about Abraham, there's a couple things that we have to address here that are very important. I hope we have nailed down firmly in the mind that Satan, the enemy's basic MO, is to undermine and to bring doubt into our minds about the character of God. So far, so good. You remember the statement, it is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God. And then it, he, it, the statement went on to say that he causes us, he, he seeks to cause us to relate to God on the basis of fear and hate rather than on the basis of love, and he paints the picture of God with his own cruel character. And we looked at instances of that, vignettes, biblical vignettes of that in this experience of Job and the experience of even Eve in uh, uh, Genesis 3 and also of the demoniacs and the Gadarenes, and many other instances could be given. I mean, those are just real quick instances. Basically, our point here is that in seeking to undermine the character of God, the trustworthiness of God, the person of God, Satan has brought about a, a climate and environment of distrust. And in, an, in a climate and an environment of distrust, sin is the natural consequence. Now, just a quick word on this. I want to talk to you just very briefly about what C.S. Lewis calls the eternal mystery, right? The eternal mystery of God. And, and I love this idea. He, he refers to it as the greatest miracle that God ever wrought. And I want to sort of enter into that with you here for just a moment. The idea here is that God is not ruling the universe by the strength of His nature. He could. Because He has the resources of omnipotence and power at His disposal, He could, uh, to use the very picturesque words of Ellen White, He could destroy Satan as easily as a child casts a pebble to the ground. So we're not dealing with an issue of might or of strength or of power here. Right? And Lewis makes an amazing point, what he calls the greatest miracle in all of, of all miracles, is that God actually made a thing. He fashioned and formed His creation, but He invested it with the ability to resist the Creator. Right? We call this free will. And it is the grand eternal mystery that the Creator would create not just a widget, not just a robot, not just a puppet, not just a marionette, but He creates a will an actual being that possesses will and intelligence and reasoning and volition, and then he, he doesn't just provisionally give that over and say, you can keep your free will as long as you continue to make decisions that are in harmony with my will. He literally, genuinely gives actual free will to his creation. Lewis calls this the eternal mystery. The greatest of all miracles that the creator could be resisted by his creation. Are you with me, yes or no? Well, the moment that that resistance takes place, the moment that that rebellion takes place, the rebellion that we've been describing, where Lucifer, you know, suggested that he had access to what was behind the veil so that he could go and say, hey, look, I know what you don't know. I've had access. I'm concerned about what's back there. The moment that he begins his plan, his clandestine plan of undermining and innuendo and subterfuge, God could solve this problem in just two moments, right? He could just... He could just give Satan a good whacking, a good kicking, or he could just blink his eyes and blink Lucifer out of existence. Right? He, he, the, the whole thing could be instantaneously solved just like that, which raises the question, why doesn't he do that? Why doesn't he do that? And part of the answer lies in this fact. God, rather than overpowering his creation with the force of his character and will, which incidentally would only be to confirm the basic accusation of Lucifer, 
Rather than winning, listen to this carefully, rather than winning, or even winning is the wrong word, rather than, than uh, uh, um, su- causing his creation to submit based on the force or the strength of his nature, he is God after all, he will woo and win his creation back on the beauty of his character. See, God is powerful, but the kind of power that God exercises is not a power that most of us would exercise given the opportunity to do so. He exercises what Shelley talked about the other day, the power of love. Rather than, rather than forcing back on the strength of His nature, He will woo His creation back by the beauty of His character. So far, so good? Well, that's not going to be an easy process. It's going to be a painful Uh, pain-filled, suffering-filled, difficult, complex, circuitous process, and it is the process in which we find ourselves now. Now, speaking of of Abram and getting up to to Genesis chapter 12, we've got to mention a couple things here. We often talk about the sin problem only in terms of Genesis chapter 3, and we've, we've spent time on that. We talked about shame and fear and hiding and covering and blaming and all of that. And essentially, Genesis chapter 3, you could summarize it. It would not be an oversimplification to say that the message of Genesis chapter 3 is man's disloyalty to and severing from God, right? It's a, it's a vertical separation where they chose to basically go their own way, and God essentially honored their choice. But in those opening chapters, those quick 2,000 years of human history, Genesis 1 to 11, there is another sin problem. And it's not just the sin problem of Genesis 3 that God is setting out to bring healing and restoration to. It's the sin problem of Genesis 11. Now, the sin problem of Genesis 11, and you tell me, Bible students, what happens in Genesis 11? We've mentioned it a couple times. It's the Tower of Babel. The sin problem in Genesis 11 is very interesting. It says in Genesis chapter 11, you can read the first several verses there, it says that, that the, all of the people were of one mind and of one voice, and they basically said, now listen to this, this is very interesting, they said, let us make a name for ourself, right? So they were unified, and we think, oh, unity is a good thing, right? Depends on what you're unified on. Here we have a profound unity, a unity that is so profound and so thoroughgoing that God Himself has to come down and personally investigate and interrupt the unity that had become so, that had so galvanized humanity. But notice that it was a unity built around making a name for ourselves. It was a unity based on self-preservation and selfishness. So far, so good. So look at what God does. God confuses their languages and thus effectively separates or fractures the various uh, groups of humanity all over the earth. You with me? So in Genesis 1 to 11, basically Moses paints the picture like this. You have two major problems. Number one, a personal severing from God, which is largely the problem of Genesis chapter 3. Um, A turning away from God, but then you have the problem of Genesis chapter 11, which is humanity being separated from their own communities and from themselves. And so we make all kinds of divisions now. We say, oh, those people live on that side of the mountain, but we live on this side of the mountain. Those people have black skin. These people have white skin. Those people live on that side of the river. These people live on this side of the river. And all of a sudden you have these linguistic, social, racial, geographical distinctions between people and millions. No. Perhaps hundreds of millions or more have been killed. People have been killed on the basis of these distinctions, these arbitrary lines that are drawn between God's children. You with me, yes or no? The whole world is a mess. It's a complete mess, right? People elevating themselves and thus devaluing others on the basis of, of, of foolish things like skin color or height or language or, or even religion right? This is the world in which we live. It is a fractured, fragmented humanity, and that is the sin problem of Genesis chapter 11. Now, I don't have time to go into this in too much detail, but let me just say this. Very interesting. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost, God starts reversing the curse. Now, watch what He does. In, Gen- in, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, it says they were all in one accord in one place. Now, don't miss that. You have a profound unity in Genesis 11, but it's a unity for self. 
And you have a profound unity in Acts chapter 2 where they wanted to make a name for ourselves. The church in Acts chapter 2 says we want to make a name for God on earth. And you know what God does? He brings the languages back together in Christ. Oh, this is a profound point. And by the way, it's the very point that Luke is making in the book of Acts. Because what happens is this thing that started off in Abraham, that started off as a very Jewish thing, and this is the tension of the book of Acts, Jewish scriptures and a Jewish Messiah and a Jewish economy and a Jewish legacy and a Jewish history. How do you take that thing that is patently, thoroughly Jewish and start translating it into the, the Gentile peoples of the Mediterranean and beyond? And the, the, they didn't always get it exactly right. You know, you read the book of Acts and it's not as though they just had everything figured out. They're sort of stumbling and making a mistake, backtracking a little bit here, then some advance. But the point of the book of Acts is that God is reversing the curse, not only of Genesis 3 and reuniting people with God, but He's reversing the curse of Genesis 11. He is bringing people back together where the languages had been confused because they try to make a name for themselves. The languages are now unconfused and there's unity, there's connectivity, and the connectivity is in Christ. Amen? So in restoring the covenant, which we've talked about the family of God and the family of earth, having been broken, that relationship having been broken, God is bringing families back together on earth, and He's also bringing His family back to the family of man, which is why, which is why we can have Julia come here and talk to us about Russia. I've, I've not yet been to Russia. I've not had that privilege, but there are many places where I have been, and uh, I've traveled all over the world, and I have seen people with very different uh, uh, eating habits and clothing habits and, uh, and uh, the way that they talk and the way that they carry themselves and the places in which they live. These are, these are not my people. Ah, but in Christ, these are my people. In fact, I had a privilege recently of being in the Philippines and I stood up in front of oh, five or 6,000 people and I said, here is a profound gospel truth. I am more connected with and more identified with all of you people here, Sabbath morning, thousands of them. I said, you are more my people than my fellow Americans are my people. Because I am an American and, uh, and I, I was born here. By the way, I've never understood the thing about being proud of something you had no control over. I just have to say that. People say, oh, I'm, pr I'm pr uh, proud to be black. I'm proud to be white. How pray tell? Was that a choice you made? Now, if you have done something and you have acquired something, you did really good on a test, or you, if, if there's something that you have done, look at this car that I built. Well, that's something to be proud of. It's something you did. But you didn't choose to be born white, and you didn't choose to be born black, and you probably didn't choose to be born in the United States. All of this, you know, balderdash about being prideful of things that you have no control over, away with it. The thing that unites us and that binds us together, and yes, I feel a tremendous solidarity with the United States of America. I'm happy that I was born here because of all the countries on earth, no offense to other countries. I feel most ideologically identified with the United States because I see it as the principles of the United States growing out of what Scripture says. You with me on that? And so that is a choice that I have made. It's a choice that I have made. Sure, I was born here, but I am happy now to be in this country where the principles of religious liberty and civil liberty are at least given lip service to and are part of our founding father's legacy. So far, so good. But here's the point. My identity with my fellow Americans is this big and my identification with them compared to my identification with others who have put their faith in God's Messiah, Jesus. So I can look at black-skinned people who don't even speak my language and who don't live like I live, eat like I eat, or act like I act, and I can say, you are my people. And the linguistic barrier is a bit of a, a, you know, it's a bit obnoxious on this side of eternity, but God will sort all of that out. And what He began to do in Acts chapter 2 with the bringing back together of the nations and the languages, He will finally and fully complete in the new heaven and the new earth. Yes, we are various citizens, we are countries of our, of our very, uh, citizens of our various countries and nations and kingdoms. I get that, but we are first and foremost citizens of God's kingdom on earth. This is the reversal of the curse, not only of my connection with God, the reversal of the curse of Genesis chapter 3, but the reversal of the curse of Genesis chapter 11, where God is bringing the nations back together. What did he say there in Isaiah? My house will be called a house of prayer for all people. And this is what I love about the three angels' messages, because they're to every nation, kindred, tribe, and language. 
This is not a little parochial message to be guarded and kept away. No, there is a universality in this message. It is for everyone, the educated, the uneducated, the black and the white, the male, the female. It's for everyone. Whoo! Can you say amen? amen? So Genesis chapter 12, out of this, this quick 2,000 years of history, Moses gets right to Genesis 12. He has a point to make. He races to Abraham. And here's why. I'll give you the punchline of the sermon right up front so you know where we're going. Because biblically speaking, there is not discontinuity between the Old and the New Testaments. There is a radical continuity. And the continuity is built around God's covenant with Abraham. God's covenant with Abraham is, is let me say it this way. The covenant with Abraham is God's answer to the sin of Adam. Did you get that? God's answer to the sin of Adam is His covenant with Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant becomes absolutely central and normative for everything that God does on earth. In fact, let me just show you that idea here. Go to Genesis 6. Let's just talk briefly about Noah. Because before we get to Abraham, God makes a covenant with Noah. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 18. God says, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. God establishes a covenant with Noah. Incidentally, he had already established a covenant, which CA did a great job the other day of identifying for us the legal stipulations and the non-elasticity uh, that's contained in, a, in, an, in an agreed upon covenant. Even though the language is not used, God had a covenant relationship with Adam and Eve. Yes or no? Yeah, and the covenant basically went something like this. Um, I am your father, you are my children, you can eat of every tree, be fruitful and multiply, have a great time, just don't eat of that tree. So far so good? It was a covenant in a sense based on faith, faith in God's goodwill and in God's good character, not based on the faith in, not, not faith in the righteousness of Christ, that was not yet necessary, but faith in God's goodwill and in God's good character. There's reasons for you not to eat of that tree, and so in this covenantal relation, God trusts Adam and Eve. Ooh, he did what? He trusted Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve, what did they do to God? They trusted God, and that's what we've already said. All relationships are built on time and trust, time and trust, time and trust. Yeah, which is why the Sabbath is so significant. We don't have time to develop that. That's why the Sabbath becomes a sign of the covenant, because it's time and trust. It's relational, okay? And when you put the Sabbath back on the table of truth, and you preach the Sabbath like that, it's built around time, it's built around trust, it's built around relationality. Now you're preaching the Sabbath fully, you're preaching the Sabbath as it was intended, both creationally and redemptively, not just it's Saturday, not Sunday. Now you're preaching the point. Okay, are you with me? And that's, that's not this series. That's another series. So, so God had a covenantal relation with Adam, and Adam broke the covenant. So far, so good? Now again, the language, the word covenant isn't used, but it's patently a covenantal arrangement. So now God does a really cool thing with Noah. He basically hits Control-Alt-Delete on the hard drive. For those of you that are PC users, do you still have to do that? <laughs> Restart. Restart the whole thing, and He does it in the flood. Now just very quickly here, it's fascinating. When God had originally created in Genesis chapter 2, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. In other words, the earth was basically a watery mass. We don't know how long the earth was in that watery, fluid form, but it was basically a watery mass. And God says, let there be light, and there was light. And then the next thing that God does is He creates a space in the watery mass. And it says that He he made a, a firmament in the midst of the waters, and he divided the waters that were above the firmament from the waters that were below the firmament, effectively creating an atmospheric space, okay? And uh, you can just imagine with your mind's eyes that it was very much like my hands here. As it were, God slid his hands into the watery mass, and he separated the waters above the, wa the, the, the firmament from the waters below. So far, so good? And that's how creation takes place. God starts creating these spaces, like a, a good painter, and many scholars have noted this that Genesis is basically a chiasm of God creating spaces and filling spaces. He creates a space here, and then He's going to fill it with the birds. He creates a space on the dry land. He's going to fill it with the animals and the humans. He creates a space in the watery depths, and He's going to fill it with the fish and the other sea creatures. Incidentally, on the seventh day, He then creates a space in time, not a geographical right? Or ge uh, not a geographical space. Um, he creates a space in time, a chronological space, and then he fills it with himself, with his presence. 
and invites us into a relationship with Him. That's back on the Sabbath as it should be preached. But now, check this out. In Noah, when the Bible says that God saw that the thoughts of man was only evil continually, they had so completely severed themselves from God and His, his will and, and, and His covenant that God basically says we're going to reverse creation. And what happens is it says that the windows of the heavens were opened. God removed, as it were, the upper hand, and the water begins to come down. And then it says, the fountains of the deep burst forth, and God removes this hand, and the waters rush from below the earth, uh, uh, the crust of the earth, and the waters rush from above. And you know what you have after the, the, the rain had come 40 days and 40 nights? You have a watery mass. That's exactly what started in creation, a watery mass. And God here now makes a watery mass, and He's starting over. And He starts over with His new man, and His new man is named Noah. Just as He had His first man with whom He had made a covenant, Adam, and a watery mass had created a, 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 a habitat or an environment for Him, He now has a new watery mass, and He has a new man, and the Bible calls Him Noah. And in Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, you can go look at it yourself. It says, my Bible says, your Bible says probably, Noah was a farmer. But literally what it says in the Hebrew is, Noah was an earth man. Now you tell me, who was the first earth man? Adam was made of the earth. Noah is here made of the earth. And fascinatingly, the, the first earth, uh, command, the first outright command that God gives to Adam and Eve is, you should know this, He says to them, be fruitful and multiply. Guess what the first thing is that God says to Noah after the floodwaters have recited and now you have a, a habitable earth again. What does He say to him? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Same command. So you have all of these uh, scholarly, uh, the, the, uh, many scholars have looked at these various parallels that I don't have time to completely flesh out here, but God is restarting. He had his first man, Adam, in, uh, that was an earth man, and then, by the way, he falls by Ill illegitimately partaking of the fruit of the garden. Noah is disobedient to the covenant by illegitimately partaking of the fruit of the vine in which he becomes drunk. And there's all of these parallels here, and it's as if, again, Moses is just like racing through the story to get you to Abram. God's covenant with Adam was established and was broken. God's covenant with Noah was established and, and partially kept in the sense that he built the ark and God protected him. But as ter in terms of Noah being God's ongoing man, that covenant was broken when he partook illegitimately of the fruit of the vine. So now you get to Genesis 12. And the rest of Genesis is weighted toward Abraham and his family because God establishes a covenant with Abram. Let's pick it up in Genesis 12 verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you and make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now people have noted the various elements of this covenant relation. You get the land, you get the covenant, and you get to bless. Um, but here's a fascinating thing. Notice that the whole covenant is built around a bunch of stuff that God is going to do. That's the, that's the first thing that must jump out at you when you read this arrangement that God has with Abraham. He basically says, Abraham, I need you to get out of your country and from your, your father's house because I need you in your own place. I need to start with a tabula rasa, a clean slate. He tried it with Adam. He tried it with Noah. And he says, I need you in a new place because, now watch this, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and 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 I'm going to do this. In other words, it's inescapable that the covenant that God made with Abraham was based not on Abraham's promises to God, but God's promises to Abraham. That's the point. And that's the gospel. Oh, that's the gospel right there. If all we had was Genesis 12, 1 to 3, we'd have enough. Plenty enough that the heart and soul and guts of the gospel is not about those <laughs> those, those ridiculous and, and uh, non-strong and, and uh, weak promises that you make to God. It's the promise that God has made to you, and your responsibility is to believe it. You believe it. Yes, sir. All right, now check this out. He, 
begins to believe the promises of God, and Abraham, more than Adam, more than Noah, latches on to this basic truth of the covenant, that God is the one who will make the promises, and He is the one who will keep the promises. Oh, let's say that. God is the one who will make the promises, and He is the one who will keep the promises. And all of the New Testament writers, Paul in particular, pick up on this. They, they basically say, it just universally in the New Testament, that the reason that the Abrahamic covenant is so normative for the Old Testament and the New is that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed. The heart and soul, I'm going to say it again, the guts of the gospel is not about the promises that you've made to God. And all of us have made promises to God that we have subsequently broken, usually within moments. But sometimes we make it a few days or even weeks. But, but and here's the point. God has extended Himself in covenant. God has extended Himself in promise, and He's never broken a single promise that He made. Now, Genesis 15. Genesis 15 gets to the kind of heart of the covenant language. We'll pick it up in verse 18. Genesis 15 in verse 18. There's the covenant language, then we'll go back. On the same day the Lord made a covenant. I'm in Genesis 15, 18. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to, you, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Rephaim, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. He makes a covenant with Abram. I keep saying Abram and Abraham interchangeably. You'll forgive me for my imprecision there. We know who we're talking about, right? Now, in making this covenant, a very interesting thing happens. God essentially says that you will have a child, that you will have descendants. Well, that's going to be problematic because Abraham at this point is an old man and he doesn't have children, right? And so he sets out to keep God's promises. Woo! Did you hear that? He sets out to keep, because he's an old man and Sarah's old, and after he had made the initial promise back in Genesis chapter 12, a number of years have gone by now and he still has no descendants. He still has no evidentiary indication that God is going to keep His promise. And so, like we are inclined to do, just like Adam and Eve, right? They, rather than waiting for the covering of God to come and the good news of God to come, they tried to make their own good news and cover themselves, right? And so, in a natural state of self-dependence and self-reliance, he submits to Sarah's suggestion, which he obviously was complicit in, um, he may have even been a, a, a kind of initiator in it. We don't have all the details here, but he agrees to take Hagar, right? And that's Genesis 16, by the way. So Genesis 15 is God established, Genesis 12 to 15, God establishes his covenant. It's a covenant based on faith, and it's a covenant based on the literal genealogical descendants of Abraham. Then Genesis 16 is, is Abraham trying to keep God's part of the promise, now, this is where things get really interesting, and I don't mean to be indelicate or non-decorous here, but I do need to just tell you what Scripture says. In Genesis 17, God gives what the Bible calls the sign of the covenant, and the sign of the covenant is circumcision. Now, we're going to spend just a moment on circumcision. Here's the point. God basically shows up to Abraham and says, you're going to have a son. Arrow, uh, uh, Sarah will bear a child, and you will get the land. You will get the descendants. You will. And he says, oh, Lord, Abram says, let Ishmael live before you, my son. And God says, well, it is true. He is your son, but he's not the promised son, right? That's your son. And, he, and as such, I will treat him uh, fairly and kindly and, and magnanimously because that's in keeping with my character, but he's not the promised son. And you will forgive my indelicacy here. God essentially says, here is the sign of my covenant with you. You will circumcise your foreskin, the foreskin of your flesh. Now, basically what he's saying here is you tried to solve the problem of a descendant, you tried to keep the covenant by resorting to your own masculinity, your own power, and your own ingenuity. And so God essentially says, symbolically, we're going to cut the tip of that thing off. Are you with me? We're going to cut the tip of that thing off, and I'll still fulfill my promise to you. Oh, you've want, what, what, we, I mean, what a strange thing for God to say. I mean, a, a, a circumcision is a weird thing. You just have to be straight up about it. I mean, it's like, whoa, wh where does that come from, 
right? I mean, you wouldn't just invent that. Hey, let's start cutting stuff off, and let's start there. <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't do that. Now, now, many of you are sitting there thinking, well, you know, of course, circumcision. But it's because our own familiarity with it that we've just grown accustomed to something that's actually kind of strange. Yes or no? The Romans regarded, and this is one of the major reasons that there was disconnect, not one of the major, one of the many reasons that there was disconnect between the Romans and the Jews, because they regarded the, circumcision, the practice of circumcision as roundly primitive and superstitious. Like, ugh, what is that? right? But the theological reasoning behind it is that God establishes His covenant. He says, I will keep my promises to you. Abraham grows impatient with God's timing. Woo, you heard that, didn't you? He grows impatient with God's timing, and so he decides to do for God what God said He would do for Abraham, right? And God says, let me give you a sign, and it'll be not just a sign for you because I know all your descendants are going to be prone to that same inclination, and that is to try and do for God what God said He would do for you will snip that thing off as a perpetual sign, as a sign that the gospel is not about the promises that you made to me, it's about the promises I made to you, and I'll keep my promises. That's circumcision. By the way, when Paul gets to the New Testament, and the Jews had taken, not all of the Jews, but many of the Jews of, of first century Judaism had taken, and they had actually made, and this is one of the most astonishing ironies in all of Scripture, they had taken circumcision, and they had turned it into a rite of initiation that was a kind of, I wouldn't say meritorious, but it was certainly a symbol of their national ethnic identity, right? And this is, this is one of the major things, which is why you have so much controversy in the New Testament over circumcision, because do you circumcise the Gentiles? Paul says, no, I don't think so. How that's going to be a tough sell, <laughs> right? And then even later, Paul has the audacity to say, even the Jews don't have to be circumcised. And here's one of the great ironies in Scripture, and that is that the very symbol that was a symbol of righteousness by trusting to the faithfulness of God had become a symbol of our own righteousness and identity, and so Paul has to make this fantastic argument in the book of Romans where he says, why don't you remind me, writing to his, uh, to his Jewish uh, uh, re readers and listeners, why don't you remind me, did God make his promise and covenant with Abraham before or after he was circumcised? You tell me, what's the answer to that question? Before, circumcision was almost punitive as a reminder a reminder, a continual reminder that the heart and guts of the covenant is God's promises to you, and your response is to believe. And Abraham got it mostly right. He got it, what did I say? Mostly right, which is why the New Testament picks up on Abraham, 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 because he believed God. Now, did he always get it exactly right? No. He said, Sarah's my sister. Not only once, he said it a second time. And so we see Sarah, uh, Abraham as a pretty good example of headed generally in the right direction, but sometimes stumbling, sometimes fumbling, and sometimes not getting it exactly right. Exactly the kind of hero we need, by the way. Did you get that? Someone who is like us, who we can relate to. We can say, yeah, that's what it looks like. Now, the descendants of Abram, Abraham, to fast forward, end up in Egyptian captivity, and that's a story that you know. Genesis 2 has God saying a very interesting thing. I think it's to Moses. He says, or actually it's, Moses is just writing it, and he says, Genesis 2, I think it's verse 24, God remembered his covenant that he had made with Abraham and his descendants. Ooh. He remembers the what? The covenant. He remembers the agreement. And so God essentially says to Moses when he meets him at the burning bush, go tell Pharaoh to let my son go, to let my firstborn go. Right? Now check this out. We've already mentioned this. When Jesus comes, he's re repeatedly referred to in Scripture as the son of God. He's also called the son of man. But the son of God, and there are two primary figures in Scripture that were the son of God. We've mentioned these. Who was the first one? Adam is the son of God, and so when Jesus comes, he's basically, when he announces himself as the son of God, he says, I'm coming to undo what Adam did, okay? And who was the other, we just mentioned it, who's the other one? It's Israel. So Adam and Israel are the son of God, and the gospel writers and the New Testament writers paint in a marvelous theological fashion Jesus as the true Adam and as the true Israel, Yeah? So God establishes His covenant with the descendants of Abram, and we could, we could go into that. We could talk about, and maybe we should just talk a moment about it, 
The ratification of that covenant took place with blood. You can read this in Genesis 19, or excuse me, Exodus 19 down to verse 24. And it's very interesting. In fact, take a look at Exodus 34. Look, it's very interesting. Exodus 34. As this covenant is being recommunicated, not reestablished, but recommunicated to the descendants of Abraham that had frankly forgotten it. Exodus, what chapter did I say? That's right. And verse 28. So he, speaking of Moses, was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the ten commandments. Now this is where things get amazing. They've already been amazing. Now they get even more amazing. God basically says, build me a house. I'm going to teach you this. Some of you are visual learners. Some of you are auditory learners. I'm going to give you not only the words, the oracles. I'll give you a depiction of how this is going to work. Build me a house. And the house will have three compartments. It'll have a courtyard, a holy place, and a most holy place. And there, these will be the various ceremonies and other details surrounding this sanctuary. I'm reading a book right now by Roy Gain that's just blowing my mind on the details and idiosyncrasies, particularly of the Day of Atonement. By the way, it's a great book. It's called Cult and Character. Highly recommended. Cult and Character. So anyway, basically you have the courtyard, holy place, most holy place. And God says, build a box. Build a what? A box and overlay it with gold as a symbol of, of value and, of, and of, of importance and of beauty. And uh, build this box and put the tablet, the contract of the covenant inside of the box. Put a lid over it, the mercy seat, and I will dwell there. It's as if God is saying, not as if, God is saying, I will reside in my place, in my most holy place, and I will stand on, I will sit on the terms of the covenant waiting for you to come into my presence. I am here where I have always been. And this was the most holy place. And the most holy place was just exactly what it sounds like, the most holy place. But inside of the most holy place, the singular piece of furniture there was a box. And what made the box so important, the Ark of the Covenant, was what was in there. And what was in there was the terms of the relational connection of the family of God, not a mere list of rules. Shame on you for having ever thought of the Ten Commandments as that. And shame on me for doing the same. The Ten Commandments are so much more than a list of prohibitions. You can't, you can't, you won't, you won't, you aren't allowed to, you aren't allowed to. Oh, no, no, no. These are, these are the, the, the encapsulation of the whole law that defines and prescribes and protects a holy relationship. We know this because when Jesus was asked in the New Testament, all right, Jesus, what are the great commandments in all the law? I mean, there are hundreds of them. What, 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 what's the most important? He's like, oh. So glad you asked. The great commandment in the law is to love the Lord. What a funny thing to say. What's the most important rule? And Jesus says, to love? Since when is love a rule? Since when is love a commandment? It's, it's, and this is another great book that you should read if you've not yet read it. It's called The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day by Dr. Sigve Tonstad. This book is marvelous, The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day. And in there, Dr. Tonstad, published by Andrews University Press, in there, Dr. Tonstad calls the Sabbath, oh, I love this, he calls the Sabbath the reluctant commandment. Right? It's the reluctant commandment because it's a little problematic to command someone to spend relational time with me in intimacy, right? So is it a commandment? Yes or no? Yes, but it's the reluctant commandment. And all of the Ten Commandments are reluctantly prohibitive, in fact, in their original language. They're not, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. A better re rendition is, you will not. Now we're getting somewhere. Not prohibitions, but promises. You will not have other gods before me. Really, God, you can enable me? You won't. And you will not take my name in vain. Really, God, you can do that to me? I, I can do that. You won't. And you will not commit adultery. Really, you can do that even to me? These are promises. This is exactly what Ellen White says, and she was profoundly insightful in her basic exegesis. She said all of his biddings are, do you know this? Enablings. That's just another way of saying the Ten Commandments are not primarily pro prohibitory. They're promises. The promissory, and God puts them in that little box, and He says, this is the guts. This is the covenant. This is what it's about. And so when Jesus was asked, what's it all about? What's the great commandment? He said, oh, that's an easy one. 
you will love the Lord your God. And listen to this language, it's borderline romantic. With all of your heart, with all of your mind, and all of your soul, you can render that and say, you will fall in love with who I am. Again, an interesting commandment, a reluctant commandment, but a commandment nonetheless. And the second one is like it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. And right here, we have an embryonic form, the, the essence of the covenant. Supreme love for God and authentic love for mankind. So far, so good? By the way, this solves the problem of Genesis 3. And this solves the problem of Genesis 11. Oh, you get that? Genesis 3, reconnected with God in love and intimacy and trust, trust, and solving the problem of Genesis 11, which is being cut off. Oh, you're black, you're white, you're male, you're female, you're slave, you're free, you're educated, you're uneducated, you're Russian, you're American. No, away with it. Yeah, away with it. In fact, oh man, I don't have time, but, but, but even there, there was a parochial sense in Jesus' day about, oh, I am loving my neighbor, and my neighbor is my people, the people I live next door to. And Jesus said, let me tell you a story about a good Samaritan. He takes the whole thing, and he takes the apple cart, and he just turns it over, and it just, all the apples go everywhere. Yeah, there was this guy, and he'd fallen down and, among thieves, and a Levite walked by, hmm, a Levite walked by, and a priest walked by, hmm, a priest walked by. And then a Samaritan came and took care of him and healed him and wounded, uh, and, and healed up his wounds and put him on his horse and took him to the inn and paid for him. Now, which one of these guys is the neighbor? And they were stuck. Because their parochial little view of what it meant to really love humanity had just been overturned. He was basically saying all of these regional, racial, religious distinctions that you are making between you and other people, away with it. We are not only solving the problem of Genesis 3, which is love between God and man, the, the covenant solves the problem between people groups on earth black and white and, and, and yellow and red and, and all of the different male and female. God says, put that in the most holy place. And so what we have here is a, is a picture. It's a drama. It's, a, it's for those, some of us are verbal listeners or verbal learners and others are more visual learners. And God gives a, a play, basically, a divine play that happened 359 days out of a Jewish year. And then on that 10th day of the seventh month, the high priest and I, this is not this series, but the point is he goes into the most holy place, into communion, into at one with God, and that at one that love, that what? Love. That love and that appreciation and that trust is founded on this right here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. One, two, three, four commandments, and love your neighbor as yourself. One, two, three, uh, six, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten commandments, and that right there is the heart and soul of the covenant. So far, so good. Except the rest of the New Testament is basically an uh, Old Testament, rather, is basically an uninterrupted history of breaking the covenant. God extends His covenant hand to Adam, and Adam breaks the covenant. God extends His covenantal hand to Noah. Noah keeps part, breaks most of the covenant. God extends His covenantal hand to Abram, and Abraham gets the basic idea. Wait a minute. God's making me a lot of promises, and God's God, and He's awesome, and He's big, and He's gracious. I believe Him. Amen. And God says, that's it. That's exactly it. That's it. That's it. That's it. You believe, I will do, and I will, and I will, and I will, and I'm going to do this, and it's going to be awesome. I'm going to do this. And Abram says, yeah, he is going to do this. And he waits a few years and it doesn't happen. So he sort of goes the Hagar route and God says, hey, we need a reminder about this. Shoo. <laughs> you with me? We need a reminder about that. So that for every generation, generation to generation to generation, there would be a reminder that the essence of the covenant is not about what I do to fulfill my promises to God. It's about what God has done to fulfill his promises to me. Amen. So far, so good. And yet you read the Old Testament Broken covenant after broken covenant after broken covenant. God extends his hand. And no, no, don't get me wrong. There were some that were faithful for a time. There were some that got it. But on the whole, Israel and later Judah, broken covenant. So much so that when we get to the book of Daniel, right? We've just fast forwarded through huge amounts of, of history here. When we get to the book of Daniel, Daniel is on his knees. Daniel 9, check it out. And he's praying this prayer because, man, the Bible is such an intertwined tapestry of truth that you can't talk about one thing without talking about another. And the, the 
difficulty with a preacher, the problem that a preacher faces, is to keep the line of reasoning without talking about everything that can possibly be talked about. And I mostly fail, but today I'm going to try and succeed. Here's Daniel, and you have the exile. The Israelites have not been punished by God so much as God has honored their choice to live apart from Him. Did you get that? By the way, I run a school. The school is called Arise. I run it with James and Ty and Jeffrey. And the school that we run over the years, we've had hundreds of students come, and occasionally, very occasionally, we have to kick a student out. The thing is, is that we don't kick them out. Never. Never. We've had hundreds of students, we've had maybe eight that have had to leave, and when we sit down with them, they say, oh, I'm real sorry, you know, or whatever it might be, you know, I, I hope you're not going to kick me out. We say, whoa, 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 slow down there, partner. We're not kicking you out. Oh, they say, Phew, good. We say, we are simply honoring your choice to leave. <laughs> We're certainly not kicking you out. We wanted you to come. We invited you to be here. We, we accepted your application. We're glad you're here. We're not kicking you out as if the, the initiation is on our part. We are honoring your choice to leave. You have made decision after decision after decision. We've spoken with you. We've spoken with you. We've spoken with you. And we now are forced to honor your choice to not want to stay here. Oh, no, 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 no. I want to stay. I want to stay. But at that point, we have to say, hey, look, actions speak louder than words, and you're welcome to come back next year, which, by the way, is a standing policy at Arise. If you are, if we honor your choice to leave this year, you are welcome to come back the next year for free. That's pretty gracious of us, isn't it? You can come back. You go back, you sort things out, you get all those details. We'll have you back for free because we want you here. But this year, we've got to honor your choice to leave. That's what God did with Israel and with Judah. He said, look, I, I, what can I do? You see a little picture of this when Jesus, with great lamentation and pathos in, in Matthew 23, says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I wanted, wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't let me. What more, pray tell, can I do? And the history, much of the history of the Old Testament is the descendants of Abraham in unfaithfulness to the covenant, keeping themselves further and further and further and further outside of God's protective parameters. And finally God says, okay, well, what can I do? What can I do? An army will come from the north, and it will be terrible. And Daniel was in the thick of that. And here's Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 praying one of the most emotive prayers in all of Scripture, perhaps the most emotive prayer. And look at the very first thing he says. Daniel chapter 9 verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and I said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God. Okay, that's the introduction. Who, what does he do? What does the great and awesome God do? Who keeps his covenant. And then he goes on to say, we have sinned, we have failed, we have fallen, we have not. So what you have here is just as CA communicated the other day, a covenant takes two, and God extended his hand in covenant faithfulness to Adam, rejected. Extended his hand in covenant faithfulness to Noah, largely rejected. Extended his hand in covenant faithfulness to the descendants of Abraham, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, so much so that Daniel cries out to God and he says, oh God, here we are in the, the midst of the 70 years that you had promised the great army from the north has come. You have honored our decision to separate ourselves from you. You keep the covenant. But we have sinned. We have sinned, and whoo, Daniel doesn't leave us hanging, because just uh, two chapters later in Daniel chapter 11, there's this promise, and I do not pretend to understand Daniel chapter 11 very well, but I understand the, the main parts of it. My friend James Rafferty knows more about Daniel 11 than I know about anything, and look at what it says right here in the heart of Daniel chapter 11, verse 22, with the force of a flood, they will be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. Daniel is built on the edifice of the covenant. In fact, many of you would be familiar. John Dinsey just preached the other morning about the 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined upon your people to... And it says he will establish his covenant. And here's one of the coolest verses on this. It's in Isaiah 42. Check this out. And we are perfectly set up for our last presentation. Check this out. Isaiah 42. We all there? This is one of the messianic promises, one of the messianic prophecies about the Messiah who would come. 
This is so awesome. Verse 5, Isaiah 42, verse 5. I want everybody there. You've got to see this. By the way, we'll get ready with that last slide. I need that last slide. The next slide. Verse 5, look at this. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens, who stretched them out, who spread forth the earth, and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. That's creation. Verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you. Now, this was Israel the servant, but it later becomes Jesus the Messiah who was the true Israel. I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. What? The Messiah comes not merely to keep covenant with God, but God here in prophesy, God here in, in prophecy says the Messiah is is the covenant. Well, how so? Because he lives in perfect relational integrity before his Father. I do always those things that please him. And he lives in perfect, harmonious love before his fellow man. Failure, 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 failure. And, and here, the promise is someone will come. Someone will come. And it will be a descendant of Abraham. And he will keep covenant with God. Now look at the statement that we've got right here. We should have it up there, and if not, I'll just read it for you. The terms of this is a God's amazing grace, 129. The terms of this oneness, this what? This oneness between God and man in the great covenant of redemption were arranged with Christ from all eternity. The covenant of grace was revealed to the patriarchs. The covenant made with Abraham was a covenant confirmed by God in Christ. It is the very same gospel which is preached to us. Friends, God has extended His hand in covenant as God over and over again. And in our last presentation, we'll see that He Himself has kept covenant as man. Father in heaven, you...